8, and actually two verses, and this is what it says. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I'll start at the beginning. So in terms of my life story, um, if you were here yesterday, it's a bit different from Richard's in terms of his starts a bit more exotically with far-flung places. Mine is very much rooted here in the village. Um, I'm a local boy and I've lived here all my life. In fact, I noted down the places that I've lived in Bridgewear. So if you're from Bridgewear, you'll know what I mean. I have lived up the hill and I have lived down the hill. I began up the hill and now I'm down the hill. And I lived in Ranfurly Road, Kilgraston Road, Belle Isle Crescent, Gorse Crescent, and Park Road, all within the village. So I've moved by the grand distance of about a mile in my life, in the totality of my life. And as I was reflecting on this evening, I was thinking back on memories of childhood in this village. The village was quite different um, when I was getting brought up than it is now. Um, it was a much smaller village, really. And I had two older brothers and one younger sister. My sister's five years younger than me, two older brothers. So I went to primary school here in the village and I was one of the first uh, group to go into Greif High School once it was built as well over in Houston. My eldest brother, Philip, um, he went to Park Mains and you had the choice in those days. There was no Greif High. You can either go to Linwood High or Park Mains and there was a bus would take um, you to both of these places. So he chose Park Mains, or probably my mum chose Park Mains for him, and that's where he went. So I wasn't at the same school as my eldest brother, but um, life for me was kind of um, all about sport when I was young, really. Um, I used to haunt the tennis club up in Preston Road. Again, if you're not from the village, you won't know what I'm talking about because Preston Road Tennis Club don't, doesn't exist anymore. It's now Flats. And there was a red ash tennis club. I used to go there after school every day and right through my holidays. And then in the winter, I went to the squash club, which again is not there anymore. It's a common theme, but that now is apartments halfway up Preston Road in the old church. That used to be a squash club um, when I was at school. And I have memories of that. And then also other memories of my paper runs. So I used to do a paper run for two news agents in the village. One was Ralph's, which was up this end of the village, and the other was Holmes, the news agent, which was down that end of the village, where I think it's a sauna place, or a, not a sauna, it's a, yeah, tan, tanning place. Not that I've been in it, obviously, but. Um, <laughs> so that's where the paper shops were in the village. So I did paper runs, and used to come down a Saturday morning, get my paper money, and then go along to the chippy, which doesn't exist again, and uh, play asteroids in the machine and buy a poke of chips and then go up the road. And that was my Saturday morning. And then Saturdays for me as a child down to the Glen to play football all day Saturday. And there's a hill in the Glen. You played half of your match going up the hill and half of your match going down the hill. And that was my Saturday afternoon with all my pals. So I used to uh, ride around Barn Beth on my bike, sledging on the old Rand Furley coast in the winter, down the second fairway, and also playing the building sites around Carruth Road, if you know where that is in the village. <laughs> so before that was all built, that was just a big building site when I was a youngster. So that's the kind of memories I have in my childhood here in the village. And I had a very happy childhood here in the village, loved it. Um, good friends in different parts of the village, very happy, good memories and so on. In terms of school, I was also trying to remember this just um, before I came down. So I was taught in the primary school by Mrs. Bryce, Miss Savage, Mrs. Hamilton. That's all I could remember. Um, Miss Savage was Savage and Mrs. Hamilton eventually, I think she was head in uh, Houston. And uh, Mrs. Bryce taught for years and years and years up there in the primary school. She was my P3 teacher. In fact, I went back into the primary school to speak to the boys and girls uh, not that long ago, and I took in my report card. Mrs. Bryce was <coughs> still in the school, and she had signed my report card from P3. I remember the school trip down to York in P7. We went there for a week and so on, and then up to Greif High School. 
So all my pals and us, we all went to the same school and Greif High was a new build then. Greif High was um, very modern, small. It wasn't extended as it is now. I think um, there was only three year groups when I went, first, second and third. And then we went up the school and they fed in behind us. Um, there was the big um, point about Greif High was that there was AstroTurf in the games hall. That was the big uh, innovation of the day. They took it out because we got all burns in our legs when we were playing sports, but that was the big feature of Greif High School. And I remember the teachers then, Mr. Glenn, Mr. White, Ms. Lavery, who taught French, Mr. Parker, who was chemistry, Mr. Stark, who was physics, Ms. Gowdy, who was English, Mr. Lang, who was PE, and of course, Mr. Graham, the famous Mr. Graham, who taught me history for five years, he used to always wear his uh, gown. And if anyone, you know anyone who's been to Greif High School of my vintage, they'll speak about Mr. Graham, he's a fabulous teacher. So I loved Greif, I loved school, I loved being brought up here in that environment, and had good friends, good memories, nothing negative at all, apart from being suspended once, but that's another story. And so apart from that, really, really happy memories of Greif High School. That was the uh, first year in Greif High that I went on another school trip and we went to Normandy um, for a week and that was a very exotic experience for me and with my parents in first year. So memories of childhood, the schools and also Hope Hall, but not this Hope Hall, the other Hope Hall. So there used to be a Hope Hall um, on the other side of the main street from here. It was beside Greif Garage, there's no building there anymore. And it was a bit of a feature of Old Bridge of Weir. Uh, you had to cross the main street to get to it, but there was less traffic in those days. And it was a corrugated iron, um, and it was a very rickety building. So I remember as a child, um, right through my primary school years, going to that old building. And a man, um, Mr. Tom Kent, was a feature there. Um, Mr. Uh, Willie Taylor was a feature there, um, Willie Renshaw and Mary Renshaw um, were part of that um, little church there at Hope Hall. So again, they used to have um, what was called in those days a happy hour. Um, you wouldn't call it a happy hour nowadays for obvious reasons, but it was called the happy hour and it was a children's uh, meeting on a Tuesday night at 6.30, I remember it. And I can remember coming home from the happy hour, you used to run across the main street, all these children, over 100 children there. And um, there's loads and loads of children went to um, the happy hour and, on a Tuesday night. And you get exotic prizes. I remember I got a comb. And uh, I can remember getting a ruler and a sharpener um, as a prize. And <laughs> these were big deals um, when you're that age. Well, at least it was for me. So. Actually, after one of those Tuesday nights was when I became a Christian. So um, I was young, um, I was just seven years old, but I remember coming out of that Tuesday night happy hour, and I've got a distinct memory of it, coming across and being taken home by my mum. In fact, we were walked home um, as boys and up to the house, which was in, um, it was in Kilgraston Road at that time that I lived. And um, I remember my brother, my older brother and I chatting away and both of us asked my mum um, about becoming a Christian. And I remember um, my mum talked to us about it and I, I got a vivid memory of kneeling beside my mum and my brother David kneeling on the other side of my mum and my mum praying for us and then us two individually saying a prayer and it was that night that I became a Christian. I, in simplicity, in childlike faith, trusted Jesus to be my saviour. And I remember it. Um, I didn't know much at that age, obviously, but I remember that, that I was placing my, my faith, childlike though it was, on Jesus Christ. I believed I was a sinner and I believed that he had died for me on the cross and that he lived, he was alive. And I was prepared to just trust him as my saviour. Now, I'm 55, so that's a long time ago. But the rest of my life from that point until now is a testimony to the reality of what happened in that bedroom, kneeling beside that bed with my mum and my brother. I've proved the reality of it 
in all these years. And I've never really had any serious doubts in my mind that what happened then prepared me for eternity. I was saved, my sins were forgiven, and my home in heaven was secured by my simple trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing I've done since has improved that or reduced it in any way whatsoever. It is as certain now as it was then. It's as complete now as it was then. And I'm still trusting Jesus Christ as my savior and nothing else for the salvation of my soul. So Hope Hall has, uh, the old Hope Hall has a special place in my memories. Um, as a child, I can remember the train going by and the whole place shaking. Um, and I remember my dad telling me that they were looking to um, either renovate or build something afresh. There was a 99 year lease from the railway board that was coming up and it wasn't being renewed. So they had to move off that land and they had to uh, build a, a hall somewhere else. And this is where they built here in this location here. But I can remember, um, I can remember um, a man called Sam Johnson, who, whose relatives are here, but Sam came to look at that hall and they asked him, you know, what could be done to improve it or fix it? And he said, nothing, just knock it down. <laughs> it's terrible. And uh, that's really all that could be done with it. It was terrible. So they, um, they built this hall and moved into it in 1980. It was finished by 1979, but they finally moved in in 1980. And this used to actually be the site of old tenement buildings that were knocked down. And underneath here is the rubble of these tenements. And this is where the hall was built. Obviously, it's been extended and modernized from that point. But the Hope Hall was built, was built here. Now, in, when I was 14, um, I made another decision that was significant, which was I decided to get baptized as a Christian and it happened just over there so underneath the floor there still is a tank and when we baptize someone here as a local church then the floor is taken up and that tank's filled with water and uh, we go down into the tank and we baptize by immersion and that's what happened to me when I was 14 all these years ago 41 years ago and um, I remember the man Leo Rumbled, who was here, who did it. And I've got a very vivid memory of that night. It was a big night for me. I'll tell you why it was a big night. It was the night when I asked my friends, school friends, to come into this building and see me publicly testify and witness to the fact that I was a Christian and that I believed that Jesus had died for me. And at 14, I wanted to do that. I didn't find it easy to do it, but I did it, and I was delighted I did it, and my friends were here to see it, and it was a big thing. And I became a member of the local church here um, at Hope Hall the week after that, and really that's been my story from them until now. That's 41 years here, and there's been a lot of people come and go in these 40-odd years, but there are some things that have never changed. The essential um, understanding and belief that the Bible is true, it's the word of God, has never changed here at Hope Hall, never changed. So if you come into any of the services here at Hope Hall, the Bible will be opened and read and referred to authoritatively as the reason why things are done and the message that we've got to, to communicate to other people, it all comes from the Bible. So the Bible's central, always has been here at Hope Hall, still is today. The Lord Jesus is the center of the Bible, is the center of the lives of the Christians that meet here at Hope Hall. That was true then, it's still true now. We dress differently, our services are a bit different, but essentially this is unchanged. And our desire here as a local church remains the same, which is to reach into this community and to tell people about the Lord Jesus and invite them to consider what the Bible says about them, about the need for salvation, about the wonderful person of the Lord Jesus Christ and all he's done and the opportunity, in fact, the need to trust him as their saviour. That's what we call the gospel, and it still is a vital part of what takes place in this building and what we seek to, to spread throughout the village. And so um, that was these years here at Hope Paul. Now, I then went away to be a student. So I was very impetuous and determined um, when I was young. 
maybe still am, but much more so when I was young. And I was 17, just turned, I turned 17 in June the 27th. And um, I left school when I had finished fifth year and I wanted to go. And to be honest with you, just before I left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I loved English and history. Mr. Glenn told me that the only thing I could do if I went to study English and history was to be a teacher. And I didn't want to be a teacher. So my eldest brother said, you should be a lawyer. And that's as much thought went into it. Literally, that was it. It was a one sentence thing from my eldest brother. And my parents didn't really have much input. And I decided that was what I was going to do. So I applied to Glasgow, didn't get in, didn't get good enough grades, got into Dundee. So that was me off. I was determined. So my mum drove me all the way up to Dundee and no mobile phones or internet in those days, dropped me off at the halls of residence in West Park, halls of residence. I sauntered in without a care in the world at 17, going to share a room with someone who I never knew and start this new life. I'd no, I didn't know anyone in Dundee really at all. And my mum got the whole way home and it was about another 10 days before I phoned her which is what you do when you're 17 and you're a boy and you don't think about your mum. So um, that was me up in Dundee. So I remember my dad saying to me before I went, sitting me down and having a chat to me and saying to me, look, when you leave home, that will be the point when you need to make big decisions about the direction your life takes. Because there will be no one there, you know, no social media in those days. You can do what you want. So that would be a big point in your life. And it actually turned out to be that very thing. So I um, went to the local church that I was directed to, which was very similar to Hope Hall here called Meadowside. And I also met someone, Sharon, um, the first week I was there. She was absolutely um, bowled over by me, obviously. <laughs> she wasn't actually, but never mind. Um, anyway, I met Sharon in the first week and joined that local church. Um, the people were very kind to me, very hospitable to me. I was in their homes. In fact, I haunted them, to be honest. I was in their homes a lot and showed genuine, extraordinary kindness by the Christians as I was a student away from home. And not only that, they also very much encouraged me and stirred an ambition within me just by being themselves. So there was a lot of students there, and these students were out and out Christians. They used to go down to the city centre in Dundee on a Saturday morning, and they would preach this gospel in the city centre every Saturday morning, these students. And I would join them. They used to go around the student residences on a Tuesday night and knock the doors and speak to fellow students about the Lord Jesus. I joined them. I would never have done that in Moan, but I just kind of fell in with this group and really enjoyed it, was stimulated by it, challenged by it, and actually really wanted to be like them. That was a critical thing. To have the priorities they had in their life, to have made the decisions they made in their life, it was really attractive to me that these young people were so committed to the Lord Jesus as Christians. It was out and out. And so I was there for four years, and I would say that definitely set the course of my life in these four years. Um, and the impact of that is still with me today, really. I remember it was during these years that I started to read the Bible for myself properly, started to properly study it. It was in those days I started to cultivate a prayer life and to speak to God myself personally and in my room to study and to pray and to debate and to talk with other Christians of all sorts of churches, as students do. And it was very, very good for me that time in my life. And I would say I started to really get to know the Savior that I trusted in those years. I also began to preach a little and get opportunities to speak, just that I'm speaking to you, in different churches and different um, gospel outreaches, and I liked that as well. First time I did it was in a place in Perth, Perth Gospel Hall. And uh, someone asked me tonight if I was nervous. I wasn't really nervous tonight, but I was absolutely terrified that first time. Absolutely terrified. 
and there was a big audience and they were all around you the, the platform was kind of raised up high and there's people all around you Sharon was there of course so that made it even more terrifying and uh, I can remember I was invited to someone's house from a tea before I couldn't eat a single thing my stomach was literally doing cartwheels and I had all these notes and I thought you know I've got enough notes to speak for I don't know 30 minutes 10 minutes and I was done raced through them and that was my first like, terrifying experience of preaching. But week after week, um, I would get opportunities to speak and to preach in that context. So then uh, back to Bridge of Weir. So I finished, with a few resets here and there, I finished uh, university life and came back home. So she and I were engaged by this time and she was going to start teaching and she um, lived with her grandparents down in Presswick and we, I came back here and we bought a house in Gorse Crescent, Six Gorse Crescent, and that's where I lived. Mum and Dad just kicked me out and I had to go and live in Gorse Crescent, they'd moved house. The only thing I took was a bed and a piano and I can't play the piano. But we get given the piano, <laughs> Sharon plays the piano, and there was a bed and that was literally it in the house. So Sharon was teaching um, in Pollock, which was an education, and I started my legal traineeship down in Inverclyde with a firm called Blair and Bryden. And so um, I began to work in Greenock and then Port Glasgow, and then I went over to Dumbarton, and then a little bit of time in Hardgate. And so, um, yeah, that was an education in itself, as you can imagine. So these were years where we were also back here at Hope Hall as a couple. We were truly skint, um, absolutely skint, but at least I think we were blissfully happy in those years. And we loved our wee house and we loved that area of the village. There was a real community down there when we were there. Um, it's not a through road, so the kids all played out and um, people really knew each other down there quite well. So we really liked it down there a lot and got to know people in the village down there. Laura was born, David was then born. Um, when Laura was born, she and stop work. And if we were skint beforehand, we became doubly skint when she stopped work. I remember the day when two salaries became one salary and we barely had enough for the two. So I was going to, how's this going to work out with half of what we had, which was barely enough. But these years um, actually were, they say they're character forming. They were painful <laughs> in, in making ends meet. So I wouldn't like to repeat them necessarily, but they certainly taught you a lot about dependence upon God as Christians, no doubt about it. She had also got to know lots of folk in the village at that time as a kind of incomer. She knows more folk than me now, clearly. So um, she got to know all the mums round about her and so on and integrated into the village. And then I got a job as a solicitor up in Glasgow once my training was finished and started commuting up and down to Glasgow. When we came back to Hope Hall, it was a bit different from when I had gone up to Dundee four years before. Um, but we just kind of tried to integrate and get involved in the kids' work, the Sunday school, the kids' club. Um, Sharon and Jackie Smith started what's called a girls class, which ran for years and years and years, which was for teenage girls in, in the village who would come first of all to Jackie's house and then to our house uh, after that. And that went on for decades actually. Um, and lots and lots of teenage girls would come and do crafts and things and then get a Bible lesson and so on in the house. So these were the years when that started. Um, also, I started getting involved in a work in Easter House at that time. So um, my dad and, uh, and Ron Glendinning, um, who was in Hope Hall here, and some other people from Glasgow had a real interest in that area and wanted to bring the gospel into the area. So we started children's work in schools. So there was a Bible club on a Wednesday evening in East Hall Primary, up in Easter House. There was a Sunday school in Wellhouse Primary, and those ran for years. And I could tell you story after story about these years up in Easter House. Um, so Easter House is Easter House, and if you're accepted in Easter House, you're going fine, and we were. 
and became part and parcel of the community really there over these years. I've got memories of going around the doors in these flats and seeing strange things and meeting strange dogs and things and dealing with the literally hundreds of kids that would come. And I mean literally. So there would be nights when there would be like three of us and 120 children in front of us with varying states of behavior. Um, the Jani in those days um, was very non-politically correct. If you just told the Jani the problem, he came in, hauled them out and kicked them out. And then they were barred for two weeks. Um, we gave out loads of sweets and all that kind of stuff. It was, there was no political correctness involved at all, but it was genuinely a great opportunity to tell so many boys and girls up there about the Lord Jesus literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds over the years got to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that stirred something in me as well. I really enjoyed that work. It involved a commitment, but the commitment was well worthwhile. And that stimulated, amongst other things, a desire for me to change course in life. So that's what happened. Um, I was 25 years old. I was a dad. And... I went to speak to a man called Bill Steveley, who used to be in this local church. Um, and I told him about the desire I had to leave my work, leave my career, and to spend all my time spreading the gospel and teaching the Bible, wherever that may take me. Which was going to be a big step of faith for us as a family, because to do so would be to leave the only income we had, and step out into a life of no financial guarantees and no employment and literally just to trust God for all of our needs. So when I was 29 years old, I did that, Sharon and I did it, and we both began this new life of complete dependence on God for everything. Um, we were up in Park Road by this stage. I remember my last day in the office. Um, I remember withdrawing from the Law Society. I remember not renewing my practice and certificate, and it felt very final, but it felt good and right and easy. It didn't feel strange at all to do this. And I stepped away from, I remember stepping out of the office with actually quite a bit of confidence that this was going to work out okay, not really knowing. So this is a test, you see, because sometimes, and I don't mean everyone does this, but in life, we do get tested about what we say. We say we believe God as Christians. We say we trust the Lord Jesus. Sometimes we're tested in that. Do we actually? Well, that for us was a bit of a test. Is our faith real? Is God real? It's one thing to say it, but do we actually believe it? Andrew, our third, was born up in Park Road. And that's where we live until today. And from then on, uh, the children were young, so Sharon really brought them up. And I worked um, around about the Glasgow area and beyond that in different parts of Scotland and the UK, night after night, preaching the gospel, taking children's meetings. In fact, I look back at my diaries, the longest run I had was 13 weeks in a row um, of being away, just preaching and teaching um, in different places. So it was a kind of busy time, but then you're young and, you know, that's what you do. You work hard. And that's what we did at that time. In community centres, churches, portable halls, tents even, school visits, town halls, you name it. At that time of our lives, that was the focal point in the spread of the gospel. Now, things changed again for us um, in 2005. Uh, the tsunami hit the world, if you remember, 2004 on Boxing Day. And it obviously affected in Asia, uh, places like Sri Lanka and Indonesia and these places, Thailand, very badly. Sri Lanka was the place that I get connected to. So there was people in Sri Lanka who met, like we do here at Hope Hall, who had connections into Scotland. And there was lots and lots of money raised from Christians and sent out there to help people, you know, buy boats, replant fields, build, rebuild houses, all that kind of stuff. But then they also asked, could you send people to teach the Bible? Because 
through the tragedy of war, there was a civil war there for 25 years and it was ongoing, and the tsunami, God had been moving in the lives of so many people. And many people had become Christians. And they were desperate for people who could help teach new Christians the Bible. So I went out there and I ended up going out twice a year for a number of years. The Civil War was still ongoing until 2009. And it was a change for me in so many ways. I'd never been in a place like that. I'd never seen poverty like that or suffering. I'd never seen uh, or I'd never lived amongst refugees or been to refugee camps or seen the violence of war pretty close. But I saw it all in Sri Lanka. And I would say it pretty much was a life-changing experience going out there. It changed my whole perspective about the work that I wanted to be involved in and also my whole perspective in life. And we did lots of things in those years in Sri Lanka. We opened up a whole a network of school visitation that took place through Hindu schools and Buddhist schools, through the Singhala population, the Tamil population. And every time we went, my friends and I, we would go into these schools, some of the pictures were up there on the screen, and have the opportunity to speak to um, thousands and thousands of children in, in visits. I mean thousands. Uh, the schools were just desperate for visitors to come and there was far more schools that we could visit than we could physically do. So that work continues to this day. In 2009, the Civil War came to a violent and bloody end in Sri Lanka. And the whole island opened up. And opportunities from that then opened up for me. And I started traveling quite extensively throughout Asia. I actually noted down here, Indonesia, and then into South Africa, Fiji, Tongo, Borneo, Singapore, India, Nepal, Ethiopia, St. Lucia, US, Canada, so on, to, to many different places to do the same thing, to spread the news of Jesus Christ, to visit Christians and to teach um, churches the Bible. And as I've got older, I do quite a bit of that. I do less riding in motorcycles out in the jungle and do far more of uh, going to small hotels and then teaching in churches. <laughs> I think it's just the age of my... So that's really a lot of what I do now. And I enjoyed that, going to new cultures, not so much the new food, but going to new cultures, meeting Christians from all over the world. Spoke different languages, different cultural backgrounds, different economic situations but still my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's an amazing thing. To go to all these places and you get this bond as a Christian with other people who've trusted the same saviour, who are on the same life trajectory. They're heading out to the same place, heaven for the same reason, because they've got the same saviour. And all of these places I've gone immediately straight into living with people in their homes with this bond of family in Christ which is what Christianity is as you live it out as a Christian here upon earth. So what now? Well, now I am still working in Scotland, doing some RE teaching in schools, prison visits, preaching, teaching the Bible, involved in online projects. If you like something online, understandingthegospel.org. Um, there's about 100 of us involved in that project and do podcasting, video work, articles, lots of things. Sharon and I are now empty nesters, we're that age. So the kids are all away, um, two married, one hopefully married in due course, but not yet. And they all have their own homes and they're away from us. Sharon's still busy at Bridgeway Primary, um, up there working. And we're both in fully committed to the local church here at Hope Hall. And we've got two beautiful grandchildren, Charlie and Sophie. So they, they're our focal point, not so much the kids anymore. I said to them recently that the bank of mum and dad shut and the bank of gran and papa's firmly open. Um, and that's the way it is in our life now. So as I finish, what can I testify to you today with that snapshot of life today? What can I say to you from my experience? Well, this is what I can say to you. That God is real. The Bible is true. And Jesus Christ 
is alive. And he saves sinners without discrimination. There's not a single person in the world who will come to him and be turned away. And that includes you. I've seen the poorest of the poor, and I mean the poorest of the poor. In the hill country, in the tea plantations, in Sri Lanka, indentured servants who have Jesus Christ as their saviour. The truth is this, they couldn't have a greater wealth than that possession for eternity. This world is a brief passing thing. What they have for eternity is the real thing. I've also been in Seattle recently. Houses cost us a big fortune, wealthy, wealthy, wealthy place. And the Christians there have exactly the same spiritual blessings as the ones in Sri Lanka. The Lord Jesus turns no one away. There are Christians all over the world who are brothers and sisters in Christ. What else can I testify to? As a 55 year old, life is short. Life is short. It doesn't seem that long to me since I was kicking a ball up in the glen. Or I was sitting in Grife High School. Or we were down in Gorse Crescent. It doesn't seem that long ago. Life is short. And eternity is real. Eternity is real. So here's my verse. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And as we look ahead, God willing, who knows? I'm pretty sure if God spares me another 10, 20, 30 years, whatever, I will have the same testimony to you. That God is real, the Bible is true, and Jesus Christ is alive and saves without discrimination those who come to him to trust him. Now, thank you very much for listening. I have rabbited on a wee bit. I apologise for that. But that's a little bit of my life story. And what I'm going to do now is what Richard did. There is refreshments in the back there. I'd really love if you could stay and have a cup of tea or coffee with us and enjoy that with us and get a chat. And if you have to go, that's okay as well. And before we do that, as Christians, we always like to give God thanks by saying grace for refreshments. And I'll do that. And then we'll go through the back and get a cup of tea or coffee.